and a police officer, but a family member of hers had other plans, and so she was groomed from a young age to be a sex slave. She was abused physically and sexually, so she'd be ready to handle what she'd have to endure. And then, even before she became a teenager, she was sold to become a prostitute. It's like being an animal in a cage at a zoo and everybody comes and looks at you and, and does what they want to do and then you go back to your cage. It's like you're a freak show. It's worse than any more movie you could watch with just bed after bed after bed of children like me that were going through it. You're, you're chained to a bed. You're not allowed to, to sit up and you get a sandwich and... Um, you get water, but they tell you when you're, you're going to eat, and then they carry you, almost like in a prison line, um, to the shower, and you take a shower, and it's just cold as ice. It's like taking ice cubes and just pouring them all down your back, and then you um, get ready to, um, to go and, and do your nightly responsibilities. You don't look like an abused child when you walk in there. You look like a, a willing child who's happy. <laughs> it's almost like a, putting on a mask that's painted on your face. And it's like a pretend world, except you're not Cinderella. It, I was a robot. I, if I was to do one sexual act, if that's what he wanted, then that's what I had to do. And you don't get a chance to say no. You just, um, you do it. Sometimes the man will just hold you, and sometimes he will beat you and torture you. Um, it's his own discretion. He, you're his property. And then you use the makeup and they covered up the bruises and made me nice and pretty again. Like if I was Humpty Dumpty and fell off the wall and fell apart and was broken all over and then the next night comes and they put me all back together and present me to the next customer. Most of the time I would spend no more than one hour per guy. Um, sometimes there was five or six men in a night. Other times there could be up to 30. It, it just depended upon the night. On one event, um, I was having things done to me that I didn't want to do, and it was so excruciating, I couldn't help but crying. So I had to bite my tongue until it bled, and then they took tape and put it like that. And so every nerve in me in my mouth was gone, and I didn't have a voice left. I didn't feel anybody even realized I was human. After a time, I just started blocking it out to where I didn't feel anything, and it was just numb. It was just life. I didn't know how it was going to end. I, I just had to worry about getting through that day. I just remember, like, wishing that somebody would save me, somebody would help me. Coming up, find out how bad it got before Melissa made it out of the underground world of sex trafficking in America. I remember just looking down and just flames everywhere. I couldn't get it to quit. It hurt so bad. Also, how young girls get groomed for the business and who their clients are. You may be surprised. Next on The 700 Club. Up to 300,000 boys and girls are sold in the United States every year, and many of them don't make it out of the industry alive. There are only 99 known survivors from the state of Texas in the last 20 years who've managed to escape sexual slavery. Melissa Woodward is one of them. Even though one night when she was 14, she was burned alive and left for dead. After two years of torture in different sex trafficking settings, Melissa made it out, but barely. They took gasoline and set me on fire. <clears throat> I remember just looking down and 
There's just flames everywhere that couldn't get it to quit. It hurts so bad. But that was his fantasy. This is a child burned to death. So after that, I was no longer able to be used. Um, the best thing for me was death. And actually, I was hoping at that point they would kill me. But then I woke up, and I don't remember how many days later, but I woke up in a garbage can. That closed the door to the sex trafficking. Then I was, I had a whole new set of dilemmas. How does a 14-year-old survive on the streets? Then these street corners became my hangout. This is where um, I made my money, standing on the street corners and waiting for the next uh, customer, you know, waiting for my next John to come. I just kind of thought I was an object. I just thought I was good for one thing. Everything was a fog. Everything was living in a haze. I did so much um, drinking and drugging that anytime I had a, a memory or a nightmare, I, I shed the next needle in my arm. Then I was just really guarded. I didn't trust anybody, whether it was a man or a woman. I just didn't trust anybody. And, um, became very, um, I was an outgoing introvert. <laughs> I'll say hi, but, you know, and I'll, I'll be your friend for a night. But past that, I just didn't develop relationships at all. At 18, Melissa turned from prostitution to stripping and considered it a step up. Oh my gosh, stripping was like so awesome to me. When I first stepped into the club, I was like, 90% of the time, I get to keep my clothes on, and I don't have to touch them. And they don't have to touch me. It was like, it would make my night if a guy tried to touch me, because I was able to, to throw down with the best of them. Um, it's so, I, I, and I liked fighting. I liked fighting, that's why I went to jail 28 times. By the time I was 25 years old, you just become so much of a shell, like you're just walking around, like, I had no feelings. I didn't know whether I should be loved. I didn't even really know what love was. Love was confusing. Is love pain? Is it, uh, what is it? I didn't understand what most people understand about love and a good life and what's right and wrong. And I didn't even know half the things I was doing was wrong. I didn't live. I was sucking air, but I was not alive. I was dead on the inside. Melissa Woodward joins us now for more of her story. Melissa, thank you for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. You know, a lot of people are very shocked by this story. Well, first of all, shocked by what's done to children. But second, I think a lot of people think of this as some, some international underground industry, but you say it's not. No, it's happening right here in America, in our backyards, in our communities. You know, there's 300,000 children a year <clears throat> who are sold through this, both boys and girls. The girls are the average age being 12 to 14 and boys 11 to 13. Who is buying and selling? You know, most people would think it's, it's uh, you know, your common street thugs. But the, the fact of it is it's very well organized crime. This is the fastest growing crime in America, and it's second only next to drug trafficking. So the, a lot of these men, uh, men are in high, you know, high-standing uh, businessmen. Um, with my case, you know, you can take a nine-year-old version and sell it for uh, $3,000 to $5,000. But then on the flip side of that, you can go into different places like Backpage.com and buy a child for $40 and have her quicker than a pizza. When you were in this situation, did you ever see uh, law enforcement people come? Did you ever see anybody come to the places that you were at? Yes, often. Wow. One, One of the, the members, members of your own family sold you into this whole situation. Is that common for kids? 25% of the children sold through this are from a parent or a legal guardian. Wow. How did that make you feel about your family? Even that doesn't seem like it was a safe place for you. It, it wasn't a safe place. And these children so often, you know, the reason why we have so many runaways in America um, is because the parents, the abuse they face at home and they believe that the streets is better for them and they're trying to escape reality from home. 
and, and they get lured into this within 48 hours, 90% uh, of children that run away are uh, approached by a trafficker and over half of them face sexual slavery. Within 48 hours? Within 48 hours. I could see how the participation in that at such a young age really warped your image of yourself. You know, it, it does for me and all these other children. You know, the um, the thing about this is, is we confuse love for abuse and abuse for love. And you go through Stockholm Syndrome, a lot of people believe that these children want to be out here. And that's so far from the facts. Of course not. You talked about the horrific experience of having some man's fantasy be to see a child burn. And you were very badly burned, needed to have surgical repair after that. I mean, you were really lucky to live. But how did you wind up going into prostitution after that? that how, did, how were you able to do that? Um, well, it took some time before I actually went into that. And there's different methods of repair. Well, there's, yeah, and there's different methods of, of, of what these children face as well. So, What can people do to help? Wow, you know, everyone should do something. The churches need to rise up and get involved, and it's not a pretty subject to put before the pulpit, but we need to talk about how the porn, you know, one in five images is that of a minor, 56,000 in the United States produced um, companies sell child pornography. So we need to talk about that and the prostitution side of it. And we need to educate ourselves and then spread this word. Tell somebody about it. And, you know, you can go on to for the sake of one org, and there's ways, action steps to take to help get our laws passed and changed. Um, and another way is through the National Children's Identification Program. Talk a little bit about that, how parents can utilize that. Well, every, every 40 seconds in America, a child goes missing. And this identification kit had my grandparents had this kit with all the vital information that law enforcement needs to bring a child home. They would have been able to take this kit, and hopefully a lot of this would have not happened to me. Mm -hmm. And so what a parent can do is they can sit down with their child, take five or ten minutes, do this kit, and then if anything, God forbid, were to happen, they have all the information needed. Um, you say that very often a child is, uh, especially if they're on the street, there is a point where they are apprehended by police or at least questioned by police, and that would be the value of the finger. Oh, exactly. If they can, these children no longer have to fear law enforcement, they can actually get themselves arrested so that they can be brought home and reunited with their families. Mm -hmm. Safe yes. part of their families. Yes. But we want you to know Melissa's story doesn't end there, and in just a moment, You'll see how her story concludes. But first, if you would like more information on the National Child Identification Program that she's just talked about, or Melissa's organization called For the Sake of One, all you have to do is log on to cbn.com. And if you think that someone you know is involved in sexual slavery, call the National Human Trafficking Hotline. We want to give you that number. The number is 1-888-373-7888. Let me tell you again, it's 1-888-373-7888. Eight. Melissa, thank, thank you so much for your willingness to let us tell your story you so and for coming to share it from your perspective. Let's go over to Pat for the rest of Melissa's story. Pat? Well, only one out of every 100,000 traffickers ever serves time for their crime. And many of them are roaming the streets free to prey on another child, while their victims, like Melissa, are left to pay the price. All Melissa wanted was to be a mother, and even though doctors said she wasn't physically able to give birth, Melissa had two girls and one boy by different fathers. But her lifestyle of drugs, alcohol, and exotic dancing kept her from taking care of her kids the way she really wanted to. I was so ashamed. I didn't want to be that mom. I wanted to be so much more, but I didn't know how to be there. I couldn't, I couldn't quit. I tried quitting. I, Kept checking myself into rehab and going to various programs and working with help, you know, with sponsors and friends, and I just couldn't, I couldn't sober up. I couldn't get cleaned up, and I knew that they needed me. Um, so I thought the best thing for me to do was just yeah, go ahead and leave this world, and I took off on a suicide trip. I knew that there was a heaven and a hell, and I knew I was going to hell. There was no doubt in my mind that it was better than the hell on earth. And I took a gun and I fired it off into the water to make sure it works first. 
Um, and then I put it in my mouth and pulled the trigger. And I pulled it three times. And it wouldn't go off. And I just fired it in the water. And I'm thinking, man, I can't even commit suicide the right way. Melissa checked herself into the hospital. And when she came out, she had two goals. To get her kids back and to be a better mom. My kids are coming to see me for the first time. I was really excited. And um, that day, we, we had what I used to, me and my China coined the phrase. And she said, Mommy, it's big girl time. And she wanted to share with me that she had accepted Jesus. And she said, I want to tell you about my big Jesus. I said, oh, I know all about your big Jesus, and he's not for me. She said, but you told me you'd listen about anything. And I just, I listened. So she went to sleep that night. She was finished talking to me, but God just kept on talking to me, and he was calling me, and he told me, if you'll come to me, I will take everything, and I will give you beauty for ashes. And I didn't think it was possible. I asked him one question, where were you, God? God, if you're there, if you're really talking to me, where were you through all of this? And he said, I was carrying you because you're my daughter. And I <clears throat> sat outside, and it was a thunderstorm, and and I said, God, if you're real, I've given it all to you. And I will serve you the rest of my life. But please, take this addiction away. Take my life and change it. And I'll do anything. Because I don't know that I can do it without you. And I looked at the mud and saw the rain coming down. And it was getting the mud off of me. I thought I was as dirty on the inside as I was on the outside. And so I saw the rain coming down cleaning me. It was like Jesus is making everything on the inside brand new. I, just a complete transformation. It felt like a, a piece of something had been missing, and it just got put into place. And it was just this overwhelming feeling of just of freedom. And I woke up the next day, and I didn't grab for a needle. And I didn't grab for a shot of tequila. And I didn't even have the urge to. And I knew for sure that I had Jesus living inside of me and that he loved me and that I was his little girl. I might not have mattered to anybody else, but I mattered to him. And, and I knew it was real, even more so as um, I began to understand the word. Melissa learned about forgiveness. Forgiving is not forgetting. Forgiving is something that sometimes I have to do a lot. And the reason I'm able to forgive, the reason I'm able to actually even pray for the person that got me into it is because I started making the wrong choices too. I made a lot of bad choices. Hurting people hurt other people. Abused people often abuse other people. No little boy grows up and decides I'm gonna go sell these girls. They were broken. These men are just as broken and they need a savior too. Everybody deserves forgiveness. And being able to forgive has allowed me to forgive myself because forgiveness is just about as much for me as it was for them. Melissa went through intense counseling and later married Richard. Today, she's raising her children. My prayer is that people would, um, they would find the Jesus I found. They would find their big Jesus. I pray that, that, you know, that these men, the men that are caught up in it, would find Jesus too, because I want people to realize that no matter what you've done, Christ says you can be an overcomer in him. Christ can heal everything. He can restore you and transform you. There is always hope. You know, no matter what I've done, I don't have a stamp that says I'm a reject. I don't have a stamp that says I'm an, 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 an wanting to be a mother and a police officer. But a family member of hers had other plans. And so she was groomed from a young age to be a sex slave. She was abused physically and sexually, so she'd be ready to handle what she'd have to endure. And then, even before she became a teenager, she was sold to become a prostitute. It's like being an animal in a cage at a zoo, and everybody comes and looks at you, and 
and does what they want to do, and then you go back to your cage. It's like you're a freak show. It's worse than any horror movie you could watch with just bed after bed after bed of, of children like me that were going through it. You're, you're chained to a bed. You're not allowed to, to sit up and you get a sandwich and um, you get water. But they tell you when you're, you're going to eat and then they carry you. <clears throat> it's like in a prison line um, to the shower. And you take a shower and it's as cold as ice. It's like taking ice cubes and just pouring them all down your back. And then you um, get ready to, um, to go and, and do your nightly responsibilities. You don't look like an abused child when you walk in there. You look like a, a willing child who's happy. <laughs> it's almost like a putting on a mask that's painted on your face. and. like a pretend world, except you're not Cinderella. It, I was a robot. Uh, if I was to do one sexual act, if that's what he wanted, then that's what I had to do. And you don't get a chance to say no. You just, um, you do it. Sometimes the man will just hold you, and sometimes he will beat you and torture you. Um, it's his own discretion. He, you're his property. And then you use the makeup and they covered up the bruises and made me nice and pretty again. Like if I was Humpty Dumpty and fell off the wall and fell apart and was broken all over and then the next night comes and they put me all back together and present me to the next customer. Most of the time I would spend no more than one hour per guy. And sometimes there was five or six men in a night. Other times there could be up to 30. It just depended upon the night on one event, um, I was having things done to me that I didn't want to do, it was so excruciating, I couldn't help but crying, so I had to bite my tongue until it bled, and then they took tape and put it like that, and so every nerve in me in my mouth was gone, and I didn't have a voice left. I didn't feel anybody even realized I was human. After a time, I just started blocking it out to where I didn't feel anything, and it was just numb. It was just life. I didn't know how it was going to end. I, I just had to worry about getting through that day. I just remember, like, wishing that somebody would save me, somebody would help me. Coming up, find out how bad it got before Melissa made it out of the underground world of sex trafficking in America. I remember just looking down and there's just flames everywhere. I couldn't get it to quit. It hurt so bad. Also, how young girls.